bear, bear, she whispered, playing with his ears. The tongue that was muscular, but also capable of lengthening itself like an eel, found all her secret places. And, like no human being she had ever known, it persevered in her pleasure. When she came, she whimpered, and the bear licked away her tears. Hmm, love. What is love? Where is love? Do you love me? Why won't you meet my parents? Why don't you look at me when we- Mister, I just need your name for the- for the coffee. I am dressed as a bear, because today we're discussing two stories which heavily feature human-bear romance. Both stories tackle this classic trope from very different angles. What do they have in common? What sets them apart? Is this just an excuse for me to talk about two weird stories I found? Find out after a word from today's sponsor. Hmm? Oh. Oh, no sponsor? No one wanted to sponsor the bear sex video? Yeah, that makes sense. I'm gonna need a coffee before we do this. The two stories are the 1976 novel by Marion Engel, Bear, and the 2006 straight-to-video Disney feature, Brother Bear 2. The TLDR for the whole video is essentially this, that the animated kids movie from 2006 advocates a hell of a lot more for bestiality than the 1976 novel. I'm so hot in this bear costume. Part 1. Brother Bear 2. Kiss and Tell. The 2003 Disney classic Brother Bear was a staple in my house growing up. Beautifully animated, heartfelt, with a well-crafted story and some superb voice talent to bring it to life, starring none other than Joaquin Phoenix. Do I have, do I have a large frog in my hair? The film's score, if you'll allow me to get technical, slapped. Tell everybody I'm on my way, and I'm loving every step I take. Jesus, Phil Collins was just on a roll in that, that, that whole period. I mean, Tarzan is a fantastic soundtrack as well, like... Two worlds, one family, simple life, we're in this, hold it up, the moonlight is waiting, but is no stranger here. The same praise cannot be given to the sequel. From the mid-90s to the late 2000s, Disney was on a shitty sequel binge, kind of a millennial equivalent to that whole live-action remake thing they've got going now. Most would direct to video or direct to DVD tosh, with some exceptions. Shout out to all you people who love Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. This period saw such gems as <sighs> The Hunchback of Notre Dame 2, Secret of the Bell, Kronk's New, New Groove, Mulan 2, Cinderella Little Mermaid, Return to the, the Sea, Cars Fox and the Hound 2, Aladdin 3, Aladdin the Tramp, Legend of the Thieves, 101 Dalmatians 2, Patrick, London the Cinderella 3, Bambi 2, Twist and Jungle Book 2, and in amongst all that came Brother Bear 2 in 2006. While googling that list, I came across this live-action, straight-to-video, Disney-adjacent movie that came out in 1998 called The Wonderful Ice Cream Suit, uh, written by Ray Bradbury, of all people. It kind of sounds like Lord of the Rings, except instead of the Fellowship, it's five Latino men, and instead of the ring, it's a bright white suit. I should do a video about that, that'd be fun. Back to Brother Bear 2. No subtitle for this one, though. But personally, I'd have gone for What the Fuck Happened. Say goodbye to the lovingly painted backgrounds, to the lush animation, to the characters who don't look like they mainline Botox. I mean, look at this guy. He's upsetting to look at. Famously a one-and-done kind of actor, they couldn't get Joaquin Phoenix back for the sequel, and his replacement is Patrick Dempsey, who you may remember as the boss man from Transformers Dark of the Moon. He's a notably worse actor than Phoenix, but with all the changes they made to the main character, he doesn't really feel like he's meant to be the same bear, so it kind of cancels out. What noise does the bear make? Does the bear make? <laughs> the writing quality has dropped a fair bit too. The jokes don't land so much, the overarching motivations are a bit more blurry. It's a kind of movie that has you shouting questions at the screen, because it's clear that the set pieces were worked out first, and the character motivations second. It also has a pretty vintage shitty sequel problem, where the comic relief from the first movie, 
here a role filled by the Rick Moranis goofy moose duo gets way more screen time in the sequel, and in this case their own little b-plot about wanting to sex up some moussettes. The first movie was nominated for the Best Animated Feature Oscar, which is hardly surprising considering its strong writing team. For your next trivia night, remember that the 2003 Best Animated Feature Oscar actually went to Finding Nemo. The first Brother Bear had 27 writers in all, according to IMDb, with some of their past writing credits, including Tarzan, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Chicken Little. God, that's another movie with a banging soundtrack. One little slip, doo 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 doo, the sky is falling. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the sequel couldn't hit that same level of quality, considering it had only two writers, one of whom was also the director, whose writing credits together at that point included Fox and the Hound 2, Bambi 2, and The Little Mermaid 3, Ariel's Beginning. These guys were really cornering the market on Disney cash grab sequels in the 2000s. But what about that story? For those of you who haven't seen the first Brother Bear, what are you even doing with your life? I'm boiling and jittery. I think more coffee will help. It's set in prehistoric Canada and follows a young boy named Kenai. Everyone in Kenai's tribe has a spirit animal and Kenai's is a bear. After his older brother is killed by a bear, slash sacrifices himself to save Kenai, Kenai vows revenge. He hunts down the bear and kills it, which causes the spirit gods to get kind of moody and turn him into a bear. He then teams up with a bear cub called Coda for a bit of the old fashioned reluctant father figure lovable scamp dynamic as seen in everything nowadays. In the end, after learning about the ways of love and bonding with little Coda, Kenai decides to stay as a bear. In many ways, it's just like the ending of Shrek 2. That's where the first movie ends, and once you're done applauding and mopping up your tears, you decide to start the second movie, and then immediately it's like sandpaper is being rubbed over your eyeballs. Welcome to the land of cheap digital colouring. Even the characters look different somehow. Just look at what they did to my big sexy bear Tug. Look at what they did to Daddy Tug. Tug in both films is voiced by Michael Clark Duncan, the guy from the Green Mile movie. Tug the bear? Sounds like a Friday night to me. <laughs> but I know what you're wondering. This all sounds pretty obvious. Where's that bestiality I'm after? You free. Well, the story of Two Brothers, Two Bears concerns Kenai, still in bear form, falling in love with his childhood sweetheart, a human person called Nita. Unless you think I'm reading sex into a kid's film, which could just as easily have been about adults making new special friends, the film is pretty unambiguous with its mission statement. If the moose sex side plot isn't doing it for you, in scene one, a main man Tug tells Kenai and Coda can't, can't keep the girls, girls waiting before wandering off to his waiting lover. You can't run from love. Tug. It's mating season. That is the visual message of the opening. So sex, or at least coupling, is absolutely meant to be on the audience's mind. So that's the one animal that's not referenced in both these stories as a beaver, and you think so, right? Like that's a lot of fertile ground there. Oh, that was worded terribly. Nita and Kenai formed a bond as children, and apparently the gods in this universe are real sticklers for family law, because now she can't get remarried because of that old bond, so her and Kenai have to go and burn the necklace that symbolises their connection. It is quite literally prehistoric divorcio. It really feels like that too. The dynamic is classic exes remembering what made them fall in love in the first place, like Seventeen again, except instead of Zac Efron, there's a bear. Nita's human fiancé, Atka, voiced by Jeff Bennett, the same guy who voiced Johnny Bravo, isn't characterised much. Talk about waste of talent. Presumably the writers didn't want to make Nita look bad for abandoning a guy at the altar, but she can't have been that into him if a long weekend away with a childhood friend is enough to totally change her mind about the marriage. It's never explicit, but I got the distinct vibe that Nita didn't want to marry Atka. The amount they fuss over her on her wedding day implies her tribe has an investment in the wedding being a success. Atka is framed to be the top dog from a neighbouring tribe, so it felt to me more like a political marriage. Underbaked is a term that comes to mind, as is shallow, but for now, let's just say that Nita was pretty quick to change the whole course of her life when she met Kenai. Nita and Kenai fall in love, while yes, she's still a human and he's a bear, with some pretty, uh, pretty interesting staring to each other's eyes moments. Can you feel the love tonight? Ma -ma 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 
now taking bookings for birthday parties and bar mitzvahs. The couple are successful in getting their spirit-mandated divorce. Nita returns to her tribe, only to realise she can't marry Atka because she's really in love with a bear. The spirits then, very obligingly, turn her into a bear, and they get married. She really kind of liked her life that much if she was willing to change species at the drop of a hat. The movie ends with the humans and the bears gathered together for a fairy tale wedding. And not once do we get a cutaway to her old human fiance looking to camera like he's in the office, like, yeah, you know, you think you got a good thing going with a girl, about to settle down, get married, and then she gets back with her ex and transforms into a bear. You just don't know these things. I don't know, I was waiting for a post credit scene at the wedding reception where he makes flirty eyes with a rabbit or something. <coughs> the whole story raises a few pertinent questions, such as, did Nita feel attracted to Kenai when he was a bear? Did he feel attracted to her when she was a human? Kenai was born human, he developed his first and we assume only crush as a human, so I think it's safe to assume that he was still attracted to humans even as a bear. So was he disappointed when Nita transformed into a bear? It puts me in mind of the end of the live action Beauty and the Beast, where the beast is transformed into a human, and Emma Watson's last line is like, How would you feel about growing a beard? That was my Emma Watson impression. How would you feel about growing a beard? Who wants to see my Keira Knightley impression? Fluffy pie. They play it for laughs, but I was genuinely concerned. Like, is she a furry now? Is, is she even attracted to him now that he's not the beast? But here's the thing, I'm going to argue that this, for lack of a better term, family-friendly bestiality is actually a natural extension of the classic fairy tale romance. Fairy tales always champion the idea of true love, inner love, independent from anyone's physical attributes. You're not attracted to how they look, you're attracted to their, to their soul. It starts with Cinderella, looking past someone's expensive clothes, then moves on to The Little Mermaid, with some significant cosmetic differences. Then there's The Beauty and the Beast, with some pretty significant cosmetic changes, but sufficiently anthropomorphized. Then finally we arrive at The Princess and the Frog and Brother Bear 2. Falling in love is totally independent of someone's looks. They could change entirely, even into a different species, and how you feel about them wouldn't change at all. Ah, this really is like the end of Shrek 2. Warts and all. Once you accept the fairy tale notion of true love, and introduce a world with sentient animals who can consent, then the idea of bestiality is all but inevitable. It's hardly even morally reprehensible. Oh god. We're pushing boundaries here, folks. You, you gotta bear with me. Huh? But what if someone took this idea a step further? What happens when this idea of pure soul bond love mixes with the real world, where the lines between emotional and physical attraction are blurry. What happens when we swap Nita for a middle-aged Canadian woman and Kenai for an honest-to-goodness bear? I am dying in this thing. Part 2. Bear by Marion Engel If you have heard of the 1976 novel Bear by Canadian author Marion Engel, then you've probably heard of it as that one where a woman fucks a bear. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint your depraved needs, but the book doesn't actually have any human-bear intercourse, though not for lack of trying. Oh bother, I seem to have entered a loveless situationship with this woman I met on holiday. <coughs> we follow Lou, a middle-aged archivist who works for the Historical Institute, yes that's what it's called, who's tasked with going to a secluded mansion in Canada's northern wilds to catalogue all the books and bits of paper there. It's the kind of setup where if it were a horror movie, you'd expect a storm to roll in and Lou to be trapped on the island as, as ghostly things occur. The island holds more than old books and sumptuous views, however, because tied up outside is a bear who isn't named throughout the course of the book. He's just called Bear. So for this video, I shall refer to him as Ivan. Ivan isn't big as far as bears go. He's only five foot tall. But, unlike every other short king in history, he has no trouble seducing the girl next door. I read somewhere that Engel wrote this book as straight up porn to try and raise money for the Writers Guild of Canada, but the only place I can find evidence for that information now is this tweet by Joyce Carol Oates. 
I can't think of any reason why Oates would be wrong about this, but that story just doesn't gel with the book as it exists now. Why would a quote, serious author trying to raise money by writing pulpy erotica choose to write bestiality erotica? It's like a musician selling out by making a jazz death metal album. Doesn't make any sense. I guess it might have started out as good old fashioned, God fearing human porn, but honestly, I don't get a porn vibe from Bear. It reads more like The Yellow Wallpaper by Perkins Gilman, one woman's descent into madness, but in this case, she's actually having a pretty good time. The strange thing is that the Saucy Bear Funtime Hoedown is actually pretty incidental to the Saucy Bear Funtime Hoedown book. You could replace Ivan with anything, uh, a wandering hermit, a pig, a particularly shapely tree, and the story would hold just as well, because ultimately it's a character study. Lou the Archivist is chronically lonely. Her career has brought her none of the satisfaction she hoped it would. She craves intimacy, but a monotonous affair with her boss does little to comfort her. Her life persists in becoming ever more grey. Ivan is simply an object onto which she projects her desires for a better life. Above all, she wants a simple life, a more natural life, one where she's free to do as she pleases. By the end of the affair, if you want to call it that, she's dirty all the time, she shits in the garden, she bathes in the river, seldom wears clothes. She does all she can to try and join Ivan in his world because she wants desperately to escape the life she has. So Bear is much more than the funny haha bear sex book. There's an interesting story going on here, if a short one. It feels to me like Engel was much more comfortable writing short stories because Bear just feels like a long short story, which sounds stupid, but it's all in the structure. One A plot, one setting, one climax, pun intended. This is strange when you consider that of the 12 books listed on her Wikipedia bibliography, only two of them are short story collections, with the rest being mostly novels, as well as two children's books and one non-fiction, which is a collection of photographs of Canada's Northern Islands. Canada's Northern Island? Oh my god, they're ganging up on us! Quick boys, get your coats! The end of Bear comes quickly, and without ceremony. Engel jolts Lou and the reader out of the fantasy by reminding her that, oh, this is just like a legit bear. This stuck out for me in two scenes. Firstly, as mating season approaches, Lou realizes the bear is able to become aroused, so she presents herself to him for some of that intercourse I, I know you've been waiting for, you fucking pervert. Up to this point, the two had only ever gotten as far as third base. Ivan raises his claws and tears open Lou's back, leaving a bloody gash from- Oh, that's a bloody, bloody gash. Oh no, that's- Oh god. Oh god. Leaving a bloody wound from her shoulder down to her hip. Second, as Ivan is taken away on a boat to visit a dying friend. Yeah, the, the bear has friends, don't- don't, don't worry about it. Lou wonders if he'll glance back, one, one final look to say goodbye. But no, he doesn't. He just cruises away, snuffling at the air, because he's a bear, not a forlorn lover being taken away to war. And that's how the book ends. The bear is taken away. Lou has to go back to the life she tried so hard to escape. She might want to live a simple life of freedom and companionship, but that's not how this works. You failed. Go back to your stale life and your loveless affair. Part three, I can't bear it anymore. Please someone let me out. Let's pit the two stories head to head, wet snout to human lips. The bear knows is smudging. I'm a big fan of those Netflix docu-series about cults. Of all the horrific things that can happen to a person, cults just get to me. Say what you like about shark attacks or box jellyfish, but that's just physical damage. Never go to Australia and you never have to worry about it. But what do you do about cults? What do you do when a beloved family member decides they're moving to the Midwest to join the singular enlightened family? Or when an uncle starts saying you owe them 2,000 energy? With the internet, there's nothing you can do except hope that your long estranged brother is smart enough not to drink the Kool-Aid. How does this tangent relate to our bare sex conversation? Well, 
Any fellow cult story enjoyer will know the one central rule that happy people don't join cults. People who have hit rock bottom, people who feel trapped or alone or frustrated, people who want something more from life, something immaterial that they can't seem to find anywhere else. That's your premium cult recruits right there. Seeing the rest of your life roll out in front of you, grey and monotonous, like a beige carpet, that's the frame of mind that makes people do drastic things just to escape. These are people that are projecting their hopes for a better life, projecting their hopes that things might change onto something external, a uh, group of people, a love affair, an animal. Both Lou and Nita were unhappy before they met the bear. Lou because she was fundamentally dissatisfied with her life, and Nita because she was being forced into a loveless marriage. The bear, in both stories, sentient or not, represents the same thing, a way out. The bear is serving the same function as cults do for people in real life. For Lou, it was a fantasy of leaving her old life behind and escaping into nature. For Nita, it was about running away from the expectations of her tribe, the need for her to be the perfect bride. The corollary to this conversation, I suppose, is asking whether Lou or Nita's friends or family should have or could have done anything. Is it their fault that someone close to them, someone they care about, feels like doing something as wild as fucking a bear? My grades were good, I could have I could have been a doctor. But there is still one question left to answer. You might say it is the most important question. You could say it is why I wanted to make this video in the first place. And it is this. Where did Ivan come from? Part four. The Shared Universe Theory. I need a name for this. Be the Bestiality Extended Universe. The B-E-U. The Boo. The Boo. The Boo Boo! Can I get inside your pick and basket? <laughs> Let's throw away any pretense of this being a legitimate literary analysis and talk about the B-E-U. The Bestiality Extended Universe. Bear, the novel, states, quote, There had always been a bear, it seemed. The documents Lou finds, some hundreds of years old, make references to the bear, or at least a bear. Since Ivan is the only bear on the island, I'm going to state without proof that Ivan is immortal. But even the immortal must be born, and I propose that his immortality is a side effect from some shenanigans with spirits when they turned him into a bear from a human in prehistoric Canada. Shenanigans with spirits, now long dead, resulted in him being turned into a bear, and now he is cursed with immortality, and with each year that passes, he loses more of his humanity and becomes more bestial. He knows not how long he lived. The snows recede. The people, they came and went, first with their canoes, then with their boats and ships and steam engines and motors and glass and electricity, and still he remains. Keen Eye, the immortal bear, forever cursed to life. Those who knew him are dead. Those he knew are long forgotten. And Keen Eye, the bear, remains dimly attracted to humans through a haze of bear instincts for reasons lost in the eddying swirls of time, under the corpses of his long dead gods, he remains the only Yeah, so that one uh, kind of got away from me, if I ever had it in the first place. If you're still watching, then thank you. Um, stay sexy out there. <laughs> Not too sexy. Don't fuck any bears.